Hi there, my name is Klaus Aktopak and in this video I want to share some uh, interesting information about Viking navigation. In 2018 I followed the oldest route description for the Baltic Sea uh, in a five month long single handed uh, sailing journey and uh, in the course of the preparations I did some research in the Viking Ship Museum in uh, Roskilde in Denmark and besides all the beautiful replicas of, of ships and all the uh, wooden fragments they uh, dug out in the Roskilde Fjord. I had a very interesting interview with the captain of a um, Viking ship replica. Uh, this guy is called Espen Jessen and he knows every, everything about Viking navigation, about all the methods um, of navigating with clouds and birds and whales and currents and waves and, and uh, I just want to share with you the interview here in this video and I think it might be very interesting for everybody who wants to go um, a little beyond the modern GPS or even magnetic compass navigation and, and has some interest in the old methods of the Vikings. So have fun and enjoy. So what we have here is uh, a sundial compass. Um, we actually use this, uh, this piece of wood with a little nail here. We use this for finding our way across the North Sea once. So we sailed from, from Denmark to Scotland, navigating with this one. And it's actually a replica of a disc that was found in, uh, in Greenland, in the, in the town of Unantok. Um, they found a disc similar to this one uh, with two lines carved in. And to begin with, they didn't really know what the two lines were, but then someone realized that the, the lines actually works in the way that if you have the disc horizontally then in the morning as the sun rises very low in the horizon that little nail casts a long shadow and if you make a mark on the on the disc and then wait a couple of hours then the sun will rise and the, sh the shadow will grow shorter and then midday of course the sh shadow is shortest and the sun is in the south and then as the sun is setting again in the afternoon and evening, the shadow will grow longer. So you make these line, this line by making, connecting the dots during the day. Then you take the disc out of the ground and put it on the boat and when you go sailing, and then as you spin the disc, the shadow from the sun made from that little nail, as soon as that touches the line again, then your disc will be exactly in the same north-south direction as it was when you on land made that line. And the two lines that were drawn on the original find, find that was made in Unatok in Greenland was from the latitude of where they were and the two lines were representing midsummer which is the, the most curved line and a straight line that's for the day of the spring and fall where the day and night are equally long because the curve will change depending on your latitude but also on the time of year so right now this is for the midsummer if we had from one for the midwinter it would actually go the other way around and be on the other side of the, of the center line. So with that very simple piece of wood with a nail in the middle, you can actually have a compass that's just as accurate or even more accurate than a magnetic compass because this one is true north, it's not magnetic north, it shows. Quite simple. This is one instrument that we think the Vikings could have used but we don't really have any descriptions in the sagas that they did use a sundial compass. So actually we we can say that they might have used this, but it's not a proof that they used it. Um, one of the other instruments that we actually have written descriptions that they did use was this, the, the famous sunstone, which again, we're not quite sure which stone they actually meant, but one possible stone uh, could have been this type, which is an Icelandic feldspar, and it's very brittle, so I put some, some duct tape on it to protect it. But basically, it works in the, in the way that it, it splits the light so you can actually, when you put it on some text, you can see how it, it actually slides the letters across to each other. But I can also use it putting a marker on it. If I look straight up through the stone, and there needs to be a little patch of blue sky above me, then I can actually find the direction to the sun by spinning the, 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 the stone a little. So that shadow maker, shadow marker I put here, will split out in two shadows. And as I spin the, 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 the stone, one will be very dark and one will be very light. And then at one point they'll have the same shade of gray to them and that will be the direction for the sun. But what do you need this information for? It's, it's not just reading an instrument. You really need to find out that 
When the sun is going around the globe, it takes them 24 hours to be back in the same spot. We all know that during the midday, the sun is in the south when we're in the northern hemisphere. And it then makes a full turn and it's back again in 24 hours, which means it makes half a turn in 12 hours, makes a quarter of a turn in six hours, but it also means that it moves something like 15 degrees every hour. Um, so what do you need with that type of information? Because just pointing at the sun doesn't tell you where you are. Uh, I've seen people that say, yes, with this you can find the direction for the sun and then I'm bit, and what do you want to do with that piece of information? Because just pointing to the sun doesn't give you much help. Unless you have a whole system in your mental map in your mind that the sun is moving at a certain pace and if I'm keeping my direction that way and I accept that the sun is moving at a certain pace, then as I have that movement ingrained in my mental map, I can use, still keep my bearings and let the sun move and the speed of movement is a stable that I can use as an indicator. But sometimes I need a reference point, so that can be the rising and setting points of the sun. And if it sets below the horizon, especially when you go sailing in the north in the summer, you'll find out that it's too bright to see the stars, but you'll have a big patch of orange light somewhere in that area is the sun and that's where you can use this stone to actually pinpoint exactly the sun is not there it's not there, it's right there so then you can go from a like 60 degree inaccuracy down to a couple of degrees inaccuracy with the sunstone that's that's where we can see that the sunstone actually works and also if you're out and it's overcast and you just see a little blue patch of sky above you then it will work this type there's another type of stone that I don't actually have, but um, I would like to try it one day, called an iluit, where it's more like a gray, browny stone. It also works by polarizing light, like this one. But um, I've seen it described as it's dark, it's dark, and then all of a sudden you see the light going through it when it's straight at the sun, and then you move over and, and you don't see the, the sun through the stone. I've tried one that didn't really work and maybe it's the quality of the stone and maybe it was my lack of knowledge on how to do it, but it would be fun to try one day. But this one we tried and it actually works, uh, but these instruments don't work in themselves. You need to have a, 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 a vast knowledge in your own mind, whereas today uh, everybody can learn how to navigate with a GPS within a couple of days. Um, with these instruments that are much more primitive, the navigator needed to have a much bigger understanding of what the surroundings about it, around him. And you also need to find out that navigation is actually a lot more than just reading instruments. Uh, today everybody's reading instruments and you've got a coordinate system, you've got math and you can calculate it. And it's really accurate, it's really great to have. But back then they didn't have the math, they didn't have the instruments, they needed to navigate in a different manner. You can compare today when, when you're a kid and you're taking your bicycle around the area where you grow up, then you don't need to know which coordinates are you in. You can just remember, yeah, I'm on this side of the hill and just have to go that way around and then pass these houses and I'll be home. And if you start reading the descriptions in the sagas of how they describe the coastline, you can also see that the words they give is, that's the nose of the head of that mountain coming out. And when you sail that way, it looks like a head and a nose sticking out. And then you go around them. And you've got elbows and ears and necks and knees and everything. And uh, places called a horse head or a helmet or things they could recognize from a daily uh, wording. But also that when you see it on the horizon, you, see, you recognize it as what they called it. Because there are no indications in the sagas that they have this uh, helicopter view that we have today. I mean, we take out, we take out a nautical chart and say, "Oh, yes, I see it from as it is a satellite photo." Um, but there are no descriptions in in the old text indicating that they had that world view. Everything is that you go to that island, you turn right, or you go to that island, then you continue along the coast until you see this and this. So it's much more a flat and horizontal view. So sometimes when we do these navigation tests, we have to almost unlearn what we've learned from modern navigation because otherwise our knowledge of how we see the charts with the coordinates is sort of polluting the picture of what could they have done back then. Okay. So it's, it's, um, it's sometimes a balance and you have to ask yourself is this my modern knowledge I'm sort of putting into the could the, could the Vikings have done this yeah. or am I actually trying to, to really understand and read what they, the, what they
they could have done. That being said, they were living and working and sailing every day. That was their daily job. And today we can't really go sailing for years and years and years to practice this. We're just having our regular job, going out on a vacation or something like that. And we do it for a couple of weeks or months or maybe a year. But we can never train to the level where, where they were. It's quite interesting to see with the navigation of, of the Viking Age because um, when the Viking Age started with the attack on the Lindisfarne Monastery in 1793, I think, don't, don't, yeah. don't give the numbers, I think that's it. But one of the remarks was that they came straight out of the open ocean because a lot of, back then people usually sort of do coastal sailing, which was the normal route because you could sort of always go in and anchor for the night and you could always sort of use the land as your navigation points. Whereas they just came straight out of the open and, and, and onto the beach and, and, and started their attacks from there. And that was, it, it seemed like it was something new at the time. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Um, what's a bit interesting about the, the monastery of Lindisfarne is that when we, uh, when we did the sail with the Viking ship Otta and we actually navigated with this, uh, with this sundial compass here, the first land we saw was actually a big, big mound, a big hillside, just right behind the, the monastery. So coming from the open ocean, the first sign of land you see is that mountain. Well, not really mountain, but it's a big hill. So I don't think they went straight for the monastery. I think they just saw that there's a big hill, there must be some land, let's go check it out. And then, ooh, they got gold and silver here. Um, so I think that's, that's also a, a, a chance encounter for them. It was so obvious for us when we saw that, ooh, that's, that's a really, really significant landmark they have right there. Um, but so go in the, the idea of the Vikings early in the Viking Age actually sailing across open waters uh, without uh, navigation instruments without magnetic compass and then when you read later uh, written this written sources from the Middle Ages for example they see they say that you need to go along the coast uh, knowledge can actually form and disappear again depending on the changing on politics and stuff like that uh, for example when the Vikings were still in Bergen and they had the trade across the North Atlantic uh, that stopped when the Hanseatics came up there and killed the captains. So all the knowledge that was not written, but they had it in their, in their mental map, was sort of cut off with their hits, and then that stopped uh, sailing across the North Atlantic. In the same manner, you could have had groups that actually knew how to sail with either a sundial compass or without instruments. And then you could have another group at another end of the country or, or another region in the Baltic that wasn't really aware of how to do this. Um, so you would have different levels of knowledge. It's not like today you can just Google it and find out. Back then you would have to actually be meeting people and exposed to it and train it and learn it to, to do it. So a lot of this navigation was invented and disappeared again along the way. Uh, the, the King Valdemar's route is, is, is very plausible for the Vikings. Um, you actually have a few descriptions of both going along from Heidebun, northern Germany, and all the way to Gdansk, which is a trip we tried with uh, the Otta of the, of the museum. And uh, it's, it's very doable, but when you read the description, they also describe what you see along the coast. But what's interesting is that they describe the island of Bonholm and the beginning of this trip that's described in, in Kong um, so they But you cannot see it. You're sailing along the route to Gdansk in Poland, and in the description, they tell you, but you're going south of that island and you're going south of that uh, route going further north. So they're actually describing things you cannot see because the distance is so big, but it's sort of in there describing, you can also go that route around it. So they, they, they had the idea of that also in the Viking Age. Think back then, because they didn't, to our knowledge, they didn't have uh, charts or really written descriptions more than a very general overview, go to that island and turn west or stuff like that. Um, so I think they must have used uh, local people that knew where to go and where not to go. I mean, once you start going in the smaller areas between Sweden and Finland, you will actually still find nautical charts where you've got a big patch and say, don't sail here unless you know the area. And that's still in the charts today because there are so many little rocks and scaries and everything that, that you just, it doesn't make sense putting them in a, in a, in a chart because it's just, it's just full. 
and in those areas you still have local pilots that needs to know that area and the training of these pilots is really a, a, a long training session because they need to know the whole area by heart and not just by chance. So I think you would have some very overall descriptions of where to go and then if you needed to go closer to the islands on this, and in the sort of um, scary, between the scaries, you would have to have someone that knows the area. I think the Vikings actually did use uh, local uh, people to, to show them the directions and you can even see it in, in the wordings today that uh, today in the Scandinavian language a pilot is called a los and that's uh, derived from two words. Uh, one is a lod which is sort of lead weight you use to f f sound the depth with in, in, a, in a boat and the other word it comes from is a lilse and that's a person accompanying you. So he's sort of accompanying you to show you that area. So it's the person accompanying you and he's still having the lead uh, depth sounder. That's a los, which today, even a thousand years later, is the word for a pilot, for, for a navigation pilot. Uh, so I think they have, uh, they have used it. And there, even in some of the, the, the texts at the end of the Viking Age and the beginning of the Middle Ages, there are texts that if you uh, take a local uh, pilot to show you the way, you should pay him so he could get back home uh, as a minimum. So it's, it, in that way, it's, uh, there are some, some, some descriptions that they use local, local knowledge, local people. When, when you start navigating with these uh, more primitive instruments, you will find out that um, they are very limited compared to modern instruments. But it also means that you need to sharpen your senses on everything else that's going on around you. Everything from change of color in the water to a change of temperature to a different smell. If all of a sudden you can smell the pine trees or someone uh, cut the grass or, or the fields, um, then that smell actually carries over water. And you can smell the land uh, before you can see it sometimes, depending on how dark the, the night or how much fog there is. Um, you also need to, the movement of the boat changes as you go from deeper water to more shallow water. The wave pattern changes a little. You can start seeing waves hitting rocks will reflect back and you can actually see how they, they make sort of a, a, a herringbone pattern between the waves and with that you can actually, if you're really trained, you can actually see the distance and the direction to the island or the rock just from the wave pattern. But that's difficult in the Baltic because you have so much changing weather patterns so you don't have a steady swell that will give you these indicators. It's, it's uh, less difficult in the North, North Atlantic because you've got longer wave patterns. But once you start sailing with primitive instruments or no instruments at all because the sundial compass doesn't work when it's overcast and there's no, no sun to make a shadow. The sunstone needs a patch of blue sky right above to indicate where the sun is and both are just indicating the direction for the sun. And from that you have to derive what are the northeast, southwest directions from this. And that you have to build your mental map on. And then you have to build your mental map on what's in the horizon around me. And for that one, I take in sounds, smells, temperature difference, movement of the boat. And all that you have to train your senses to read and put into your mental map of where am I right now. It's not easy, it's, <laughs> it's actually quite, it's, it's quite a task to train this, which is also why people were so happy to get instruments that would help them. Uh, all of a sudden you had a magnetic compass, wow, it works even at night, that's great, you know. Um, but yes, you can use the smells, you can use the sounds and everything around you. There's even a description from the Shetland Islands that when they were rowing back to the islands and there was heavy fog, you would have the youngest boy on board throwing small rocks out in the front as long as it went splash, they would keep rowing and as soon as it went dunk, because it hit a rock, you would have to stop the boat and see, where are we? <laughs> So, so it's, it's, a, it's a question of, of what type of instruments and what type of knowledge can you gain from it. And if it's the smell of grass, you know you're not in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Speed of the boat. Um, whether you had an instrument for measuring the speed of the boat. Apart from the discussion of my boat's faster than your boat, and that's a whole different discussion, then you only need the information of the speed if you can connect it with how many hours did you sail at that speed. Because then you know, I. For these many hours, I did five knots, I must be here. So that's the distance I covered, that direction. And then I changed direction and then I sailed this distance here and then that distance here, I must be here. So that you use it for navigation. Whereas uh, if you don't have a clock to exactly tell you 
uh, how many hours, and you don't have an instrument for how fast am I going, then what do you do? Well, what you do is you train your mind to sort of find out, am I doing fast or slow now? And then during a 24-hour run, you will think more or less, mm, how fast am I going now? And you would be surprised if you train this, how good you can do it. And we actually trained with what, some of the trips we did with the Viking ship. We trained some of the crew more vigorously on this, that yet we have to train, the, can you understand the speed of the boat? And it ended up that some of the crew members could actually lie on the back in the boat, not see the water and say, mm, now we're not, it's almost five knots. We're not quite, maybe it's four and a half. And I checked the GPS and we were 4.7. So it's like, that's, that's, that's good enough to know that you're doing between four and a half and five knots. And then you just need to know, did I do it the whole day or half a day? So you can sort of get the overall idea of it. And the whole idea is that if you do it just for a short distance, you will, buy you will definitely be off. But if you're doing it over a watch with different people, some will be off in one direction, others will be off in another direction. And one of my favorite examples was that many years ago, I sailed a boat across the Pacific and we did a, a stretch of 3,200 nautical miles. And every day we had a weight, a sort of a wager on, okay, how many miles did we cover today without looking at the navigation? And then we took out the GPS and said, okay, how much did we do in 24 hours? And one of the guys on the boat um, had been training this on the way out. So we did on the big stretch and he was a couple of nautical miles off every day. So it was 120, or it was 130, or it was 108, or it was 90. But it was, he was more or less within that, that range, but just a few nautical miles off. And then when we made sort of a landfall and we sort of summed it all up, he was, he was less than 20 nautical miles off from, from that, that stretch. Because he was, one day he was a little off to one side, another day he was a little off to another side. So it sort of evened out in the end. The Viking ships in general are specific for the need they made. So you had cargo ships and you had warships. And of course warships had to be fast and they had to carry lots of soldiers. Whereas the cargo ships had to carry a lot of cargo, of course, but with as few people as possible, so we didn't have to pay as many salaries, uh, which means they are notoriously understaffed, but uh, can carry a lot of cargo, which also means that they are slower because you don't need to outrun or be faster than the others because uh, you arrived at the market one day before the others. It was not that important. You just had to arrive safely. So the cargo ships are much more seaworthy but they're not quite as fast as, as the, the sort of the long ship. And the long ships are sort of the, the icon of the Viking Age because they're really sort of the, 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 the power symbol of the king. Um, but it's difficult to compare. It's a bit like uh, talking today about which, which car is fastest, uh, a Lamborghini or a, or a truck. Uh, they have different purposes. <laughs>